Shalom. Today we are continuing to draw the parallels between the book of Esther and the book of Genesis. One thing we found in Genesis is that all the languages were confused and separated from each other. In Genesis 11, 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, Babel, because Yahweh did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did Yahweh scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. As a result of this, we see in Esther that when the king sends out decree, it has to be sent in many languages. Esther 1.22 For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. So the problem which began uh, at Babel is manifested here in the book of Esther. Another parallel that we see is the continuing rivalry between Esau and Jacob. Amalek is Esau's grandson, and therefore he carries his spiritual inheritance, which is the desire to wipe out the sons of Jacob and uh, regain his birthright. He is known for picking on the weak and the feeble, and Benjamin is the youngest of the sons, so he might be considered an archetype of the weakest. Yahweh's command to the Israelites is that the Amalekites be wiped out as a people group and when the in Israelites inherit the land. The person to whom this task is appointed is King Saul. He's a descendant of Benjamin. However, his pride causes him to stumble in this task. Therefore, we see the scene played out again, this time between Mordechai, the descendant of ben Benjamin, and Haman the Agagite, who is the descendant of Amalek, the descendant of Esau. The real main story and connection between Esther and Genesis is the fact that Esther and Joseph have very parallel stories. Both of them came into their positions unexpectedly. Joseph was sold into slavery. Uh, he didn't know where he was going. He had no control over his situation. And Esther was just a young lady in the kingdom of Persia. Both stories take place in exile. Joseph's story takes place in Egypt, and Esther's story takes place in Persia. We see that they are hidden in the palace for such a time as this. In Genesis 41, 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came unto Pharaoh. Esther 2.10, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. So even though probably Pharaoh might have known that Joseph was a Hebrew from the Hebrew people, it wasn't relevant to the story, but Joseph is hidden away in prison and nobody really knows who he is. Esther is hidden away in the fact that nobody in the palace knows that she is a Jew. We see that both characters have two names, and this is not uncommon for uh, even modern Jews. We have a, a name which is our secular name in the na language vernacular of the country we're born on, but we are also assigned a Hebrew name at birth. We see this also for um, in the New Testament where uh, the character who is later called Paul is started out being called Saul. Well, Saul is a Hebrew name, and that was probably his Hebrew name that was given to him. Later, it looks like there's this sudden shift and he's begun to be called Paul, but I feel sure that he received an, an original name, a native name to the country he was born in, and so he carried two names. It's not like one suddenly took precedence over the other. In Genesis uh, 41, 45, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnat Pa'aneach, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Presumably, this is some Egyptian name, Zaphnat Pa'aneach, but inside it, in the sound of it and the spelling of it, is hidden a Hebrew name. It's said to mean in Egypt something like saver of the world or perhaps revealer of secrets, but Safan, Safon in Hebrew is a word that means hidden. And Paneach is just like Panaich or Panecha, which means your face. 
So we could look at this and listen to it in Hebrew and pull out these Hebrew roots. That means that your face is hidden. Esther also has a vernacular name, Esther 2.7. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordechai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So we see that her Hebrew name is Hadassah, and Hadassah is a beautiful tree, a myrtle tree, and that would be a Hebrew name. Esther is purported to be her Persian name, and it actually is related to Ishtar, or something to do with being a star in the sky. But in Hebrew, as the way it is spelt, it is stare or asater, which means also I will hide or I am hidden. We see that both characters have these traits. They're submissive to authority, even though Joseph is in this uh, initially lowly position, he does all the tasks that are assigned to him. He does them well. He receives the promotion. And he remains under the authority that is over him. Also, uh, Esther, as she's in the harem, she submits to the ideas that Haggai gives her for how to approach the king. And of course, both of them receive favor as a result of their willingness to submit to authority. I mean, obviously, God gives them the favor. The nature of both stories are the same. In Esther 9 1, we read a phrase which is Vanahafochu, which literally means that everything is turned upside down. And so the story starts going in one direction where all the Jews will be killed, and then it flips, and they will all be saved. In Genesis 50, 20, we read, But as for you, Joseph talking to his brothers, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. The brothers thought they're going to get rid of Joseph, and then the story flips, and he is the head of the largest country in the world at that time, and he saves their lives. Early in both of their stories, they receive a special revelation, which integral to the story overall. So in Esther 2, 21 and 22, in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigton and Teresh, of those which, he, which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was made known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. So early on in the story, she gets this revelation, and she reports it to the king, and it's written down in the record books. And then between the two feasts that she has with the king, this revelation comes forth that Mordecai is a worthy man and needs to be honored by the king. And I'm sure that that some reflection into the result of the story later on when it is discovered that Haman means to kill all the Jews. In Genesis 41:15, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph has given this revelation of what does Pharaoh's dream mean, and this is reflected in Joseph's later promotions, but he has this special revelation. Of course, the third day figures in both stories in Genesis 41.1. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. So we can understand that the time periods are made equivalent to the year or the day. And so it's the third day in the progression Everything that has to do with the third day, and I think I talked about this before, has to do with the third day of creation when the grass is revealed. What is latent in the ground comes up on the third day it's revealed. And so now, as the Joseph unravels a dream, as he interprets a dream, something is revealed, well, the famine, the coming famine is revealed, and the whole story will hinge on that from there on out. In Esther 5.1, now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. So here comes Esther on the third day, and here comes a revelation 
that she is going to have the audience with the king and get to appeal her case. Of course, both are the center of the salvation of the nation. Esther 4, 13, 14. Then Mordecai commanded to Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So the salvation of the nation hinges on Esther. In Genesis 45, 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it is not, so now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and the ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Again, Joseph is responsible for the salvation of the nation. There's another curious parallel in the end of both stories. Despite the fact that the Jews were saved in Esther's time, and their man Mordechai is in the second highest office in the country, They are subjected to governmental taxes. Similarly, though Joseph has saved the lives of the people, they are also subject to taxes during the good years of the harvest. And later, they give all they have down to their very bodies to be slaves to the Pharaoh in exchange for food. So many times we think uh, that there's some political solution to our problem. But here we see in both cases, the political solution came. Our guy is the second highest guy in command. He's going to take care of us, except in both cases, there were heavy taxes. Next time, we'll go on to the uh, next book, which is uh, Shir Hashirim, The Song of Songs. Until that time, keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.